une, une occasion de d'échanger sur ce qui est en train de se faire euh, autour du LTP, euh, selon les, les types d'acteurs. Mais aussi, euh, il, il a été souligné que cette session sera euh, enregistrée. Donc, si vous, vous avez des questions ou des contributions, sentez-vous libre aussi de, exprimer, de les exprimer en français. Nous ferons euh, les efforts, du mieux que nous pouvons, d'offrir une, tra une, une traduction, même dans le chat. Donc, euh, merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Au revoir. I think Jim is frozen. Désolé, Jim a un problème de connexion. C'est sur... aussi chez moi. Euh, Laisse-moi vérifier avec lui. OK, merci. Sorry, I am back. I Teams just crashed. I don't know if you can hear me or see me or not. Um, but um, sorry about that. Um, so in, our, in the chat, you will see our agenda. And uh, we're going to provide yeah, a brief update from ourselves as the global AOR. And then we have colleagues um, sharing some of the work they're doing in Myanmar, Ethiopia. We will then hear from our, our shelter cluster colleagues about what they're doing on HLP. And then we will have a chance to share uh, resources. So if you have reports or uh, products or resources, events that you would like to share, please get them ready and you can put them in the chat. Um, so so there's your, your warning, because um, I think it's uh, great to share the. Uh, the um, yeah, our, rep our reports and the pro products that we're working on, if we can, so that we all have a, a, a clear idea of what's going on um, in this area. And um, yeah, so I'll start just with um, a brief update from our side, and I think, yeah, According to the chat, my camera's not working. Well, that might be a good thing for all of you. Um, I was going to ask you all to put your cameras on and wave and say hello, but if I can't do that, it seems a bit tricky. But if you are unable to, it's always nice to see people. Um, so great. And sorry you can't see me. Um, OK, good. So first update from uh, the global AOR side, just very quickly on the global protection cluster we have a new um, coordinator for the global protection cluster uh, josep herreros he joined um, earlier this last month um, and he uh, comes from unhcr in mexico and um, yeah we've had a initial call with him and that was yeah he was interested in hlp and we will make sure we invite him to a, a meeting uh, soon so that you can meet him and uh, hear from him about his uh, how he sees protection and, and HLP within that. Um, the second thing to mention is the Global Protection Cluster has their um, annual conference in June. Um, still finalising where exactly this will take place, um, but hopefully um, we'll have news on that soon. Um, and that is for uh, coordinators and uh, the partners working on HLP, but it's also open Parts of it are open to others who are interested in um, uh, protection and how that links to HLP. And we have specific days focused on HLP, which if you are interested in joining, um, let me know and we can talk about how that could work. Um, but I will share more information on that when we have it. Um, but now I wanted to hand over to uh, Trezor, um, the Information Management Advisor for the HLP AOR who is going to give us an update on some of the, the great work he's been doing uh, in support of our colleagues. So Trezor, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jim. 
Uh, well, first, I'll start by the task team. Uh, so it is important to highlight that uh, the lack of uh, methodology to estimate the people in need and uh, the severity for HLP is the principal issue uh, most HLP OR and working groups uh, coordinators are faced during the HPC process. HPC stands for Humanitarian uh, Program Cycle. So there is a clear need uh, for a more uh, coherent and harmonized approach to make uh, evidence-based decisions on the people in need and severity calculation for, for HLP. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's why uh, the Global HLP OR has created uh, a task team to develop uh, the methodology that would allow to estimate the people in need and severity scale for uh, for HLP. So this task team, this task team will be uh, initially launched for six months. And um, what uh, this task team is expected to do is to re review any existing uh, methodology because we are aware that some of the countries might already have um, a working methodology. So wherever it exists, the task team will try to, to review that or draw from that. And also, the task team will be uh, developing or review uh, existing HLP data collection tools and also uh, indicators to measure uh, the severity for HLP. And uh, to conclude uh, this work, the task team will develop a guidance on people in need and severity calculation for, uh, for HLP. Uh, more details will be found in the terms of reference uh, being finalized, and we hope that uh, we'll share with you the, the TOR uh, very soon. So if you are interesting, interested in joining the task team, uh, you are really welcome. Um, the second slide is about the global HLPOR uh, dashboard. Uh, being developed. I remember we had uh, this discussion uh, six months ago. Uh, so this dashboard uh, compiles different data for humanitarian uh, responses from 2019 mm -hmm. to 2023, 20, uh, and then it's only uh, information on the HLP. So here we have uh, minimal information. Uh, for example, we have the people in need to get targeted. Uh, funding requirement for HLP OR and working group from 2019 to 2023. Of course, we we still missing uh, some information. Uh, for example, actually, we don't have yet uh, the figures on the people reached uh, by HLP activities. So this relates to the HLP uh, response monitoring, and also we still missing. Uh, partners or, or organization engaged in the HLP response. Um, before collecting this information, we will first check with the protection cluster at the global level, because we know that um, in most of, of the countries in the operation, uh, AOR used to send their data to the protection cluster for uh, compilation at the global level, at the national level. So before uh, deciding if we are going to collect this information, we will first check with the cluster protection to see if uh, this information already uh, exists. Yeah. Now, um, the third slide is the on, on CHIAF. Uh, for those who are not uh, maybe aware of what JAF is, uh, JAF stands for Joint and Intersectoral uh, Analysis Framework. Uh, so JAF was initially launched in 2020. Uh, the aim of JAF is to improve the way uh, humanitarian actors jointly plan and respond to crisis. Um, in 2023, uh, the second version of JAF, uh, JAF 2.0, was produced after refinement and two further are and, and two years uh, development. So JAF was rolled out uh, during the HPC 2024 
And after that, um, a lesson learned exercise, exercise has been uh, conducted to assess the effectiveness of uh, JF. And the key findings were of this exercise were presented during a workshop in Geneva in Geneva in last January. And um, recommendation uh, solutions were proposed in relation to what is uh, feasible and also the timeline for implementation. This slide is the summary of the findings from the JAF lesson learned uh, exercise conducted by Ocho. Uh, so you can see that um, in most of uh, of the operation, uh, JAF was very well uh, received. So whether it is training and manual implementation platform and tool, uh, these were was bro were broadly very well uh, received. Uh, but of course uh, there are areas uh, where the improvement is needed. And also there is a need to have a more specific guidance on certain aspects of uh, of the JF. And also there is uh, a need for more uh, cluster capacity. And you can find here you can find here some recommendations uh, from the JF uh, lesson learned exercise. For example, it was requested that uh, clusters are adequately staffed during the HPC uh, process. Um, there will be a review of, of JF outcome and proxy indicators. And uh, also by checking if uh, these indicators are working. And also uh, there is also a need to develop uh, clear guidelines on how to define the scope of analysis. And also uh, there is also a need to have uh, more offline or self self learning uh, JAF materials, and I've I have provided um, some links uh, for those who would like to know more uh, on the JAF, and also there is a Power BI dashboard uh, that shows the JAF lesson learned uh, exercise. Over, thank you. Thank you, Trezor. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for all your work uh, put, you know, on, on these areas. And uh, to reinforce that um, Trezor is a, a, a great resource for the HLPAOR and uh, is really happy to hear ideas and, and suggestions for how he can support and we can support you on information management related um, issues. And, and he's done some work with specific countries as, as well as looking at the global area. And just to mention that alongside the dashboard um, Trezor presented, we're also developing a, an interactive map where we will be able to see what's happening um, in, in um, specific countries and, and try and link to resources that are relevant for those countries as well. So to try and um, make it a more accessible uh, resource um, for, for others who are um, working on these these issues. But I wanted to ask if anyone had any questions or, or comments on, on what was presented there. Don't see any at this point. It was all very clear. Um, Ombretto, did you want to yeah, add something as well? Oh, yes, there you go. Please come in. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, and uh, again, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just wanted to to say a few words on this um, analytical framework, Jim. I guess this is now the time, isn't it? On yes, the please. Yes, task team. yes. Yeah. Yeah, so so exactly. Uh, uh, Trezor explained uh, the work that is being done to actually find, uh, fill the gap on how uh, the PIN uh, are calculated with regard to HLP and therefore also, you know, how to track the people who are being reached uh, or the costing of the needs, etc. So this is very important, um, uh, you know, particularly in relation to the the uh, you know humanitarian uh, immediate needs um, at the same time uh, meet a bit more on the longer term um, we are also looking at um, 
providing a little bit of, uh, anal I would say, yeah, what we would call an analytical framework on how to actually measure uh, or um, give an indication of the HLP vulnerability and needs overall in a particular given context. Um, this is, uh, it's not easy, obviously, uh, because um, even if we just, if we just look at the way uh, the international community has been trying to monitor uh, land tenure security overall globally, uh, even in non-conflict or crisis affected context with SDG indicators, particularly um, the one that many of you might know, this SDG indicator 1.4.2, which is exactly on land tenure security. Um, so this, this is the process that where the international community, after really many years of trying to find a common methodology to measure land tenure security, converge in developing one indicator with that methodology that accompanies the data collection. And this data is expected to be collected by the countries, uh, although unfortunately very few of them are able to or are reporting against these indicators, which is key, you know, for, for SDG 1, which is poverty reduction. Uh, so equally and perhaps even more so, uh, there is a gap in um, how you know countries, but also humanitarian uh, actors uh, and development actors as well uh, can track this um, vulnerability in land tenure security in crisis settings. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you know we will attempt at least to provide some pointers on some of the vulnerabilities that can be looked at to understand uh, on which uh, you know pre-existing uh, scenarios or pre-existing vulnerability, the specific um, vulnerabilities related to specific households uh, come into being. You know, so for example, looking at overall uh, at the national, perhaps also subnational level, overall the rule of law. Um, you know how uh, uh, the existing. Uh, you know, formalization of land rights, the presence of, uh, you know, the, the extent to which land and properties are registered, level of informality, overall shortage of housing, for example, etc. So this is just to say, uh, you know, uh, this of course is m much more longer and maybe less practical exercise that we will be doing, but nevertheless helpful to contextualize uh, maybe the specific data being collected at the area level on HLP vulnerabilities. Uh, so happy to, you know, once we have something a bit more concrete to come back to the group and get some inputs on that as well. Thank you and over to you, Jim. Thanks, Ombretta. Um, yeah, and important to note that all of this work, we're really keen to make sure we're aligning with um, and working with colleagues from other clusters and areas to to make sure we're kind of coordinating that and uh, drawing on all of the, the great resource and work that's been done already as well. So that's part of the, the challenge, but also the opportunity that there's a lot of people engaged with thinking about uh, land and specifically uh, and how and how we might understand better the needs and, and information uh, around that. So, um, yeah, thank you, uh, Ombretta. Um, just one more thing to mention from my side. Um, uh, related to sort of the update from us is, is that uh, for the coordinators and the clusters and the area of responsibilities and working groups, we'll be um, carrying out some uh, uh, what's called the CCCPM, which is the Cluster Coordination Performance Monitoring, uh, which is a chance for cluster coordinators to reflect on how things are going and think about how they might develop that that work and also what we can do to support that as well. So that's something that will be happening over the next uh, month or so. So just to, to look out for that. Um, but and also just to remind you that we are here to support you in all your endeavours. Um, please do um, get in touch with us uh, if you have any uh, support needs and uh, ideas uh, for where we can support better. Our emails are there in the chat. OK, well, thank, um, I see um, two hands raised as well. So uh, Ramona, over to you. Thank you, Jim. And a bit of follow up on what Omreta mentioned. I was wondering if, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think just from what Omreta mentioned, it's obvious, right, that HLP, let's say concerns and risks are many fold, first of all, and then second of all, that they kind of cut across other sectors as well, right? So it's 
Uh, we may anticipate seeing mentions that are relevant for HLP in analysis around shelter um, needs and uh, and risks, right? GPV, so on and so forth. So I was wondering, Ombreta, if there's been a sort of, how should I say, um, let's say selection and prioritization of HLP risks that we wanted to have included in this joint analytical framework. And if so, because I would assume you guys were consulted on this, right, in the in the development of the methodology and a bit what what are the even top line HLP risks or threats that we that were included in the job. So that was my question number one, if there's been a sort of selection given the plethora and the complexity of the issues. And then the second one, if there has been one, which are the ones that you have decided to to kind of prioritize and have streamlined in this joint analytical framework? Thank you. I'll let Jim uh, get quickly respond. Um, yes, please. Yeah, yeah maybe yeah. just to say, uh, well, I mean, uh, first of all, this is at the very, very start. So, you know, beside brainstorming and actually mapping uh, what um, data exists in other domains collected by other actors and kind of do a first mapping of what's there. I don't, I mean, we haven't um, really started the process of uh, uh, prioritizing nor selecting. Probably, uh, you know, we will. Um, Definitely, you know, once that's uh, uh, when the initial mapping is done, we'll come back to, to the group as well uh, to, to hear your views. Uh, but I would like also to note that this is not really um, expected. And I, again, this is again open for discussion to to be a very mathematical exercise, basically, that will kind of rank almost in a numerical order the, the, the way the actual work that is already been done under the leadership exactly of, of um, Trezor uh, will lead to, where, you know, actually you come down to very specific and concrete, uh, you know, indicators. This is more, I would say, a work that, that helps mapping the different um, uh, risks and vulnerabilities, but I might or but really probably might not come to actually, uh, uh, you know, calculating in very mathematical way and ranking them in a very, you know, scientific way. It's just, I would say, uh, to, to, to be able to analyze, have elements of analysis of the context. And therefore, I mean, uh, definitely there will be all these elements that you, you mentioned, um, you know, if, uh, even in terms of gender vulnerability, for example, legislation or Gini coefficients, et cetera. Um, but it, they will not really uh, necessarily be prioritized in the same way for all the context. So it will be, um, yeah, more of a context providing context and element of analysis rather than uh, coming to a sort of with an additional indicators, which is broader and looking at all the aspects of tenure security. Uh, but again, I mean, let's just uh, just to conclude, I recognize that this is a very long work and I, I see some people in the group who actually have been part of the SDG indicator preparation. This is a very, uh, you know, it can be taken very different routes, maybe it's also good to come back, Jim, to this group and say, OK, you know, we have done an analysis. These are the potential, you know, <laughs> avenues that we could take. Uh, which one do you think is more useful for the work that we want to do so that we, we see how to, to bring to a useful uh, tool this analysis, this analytical framework that we are looking at? Uh, with the resources that obviously we have and the scope of time that that we have. Thanks and over. Yeah, thanks, Sombretta. Thanks, Ramona. It's a, it's a good question. I think that's the key point. We're at the start of a process and we will need to analyse what are the indicators being used? How are people approaching this within the, the work we know, but also beyond that? So I think you make really good points about making sure those connections are there. And it's definitely something we're mindful of and partly why it feels like quite a big thing to try and do because th there's 
yeah a lot of different things that we need to consider so yeah thanks um, really good comments uh Mohammed Al Malik do would you like to um come in Alors bonjour okay. chers collègues c'est toujours un plaisir pour moi de de participer à cette réunion qui réunit euh, les différents coordinateurs euh, de la OR LTP Donc, tout d'abord, je voudrais vous saluer et vous souhaiter une bonne année. Je sais que euh, c'est ma première réunion de, de cette année. Je, donc, je profite pour vous souhaiter tous une bonne année. Ce n'est jamais trop tard. Alors, concernant euh, les différentes thématiques qui ont été abordées, euh, je voudrais juste réitérer en fait notre intérêt pour le Mali quand même d'être dans ce groupe pour travailler sur... Euh, Euh, le processus HPC, à savoir la méthodologie, les sévérités et tout, tout ce qui concerne cette étape de, du travail de développement pour les questions LTP. Je pense que le Mali a un peu d'expérience dans ce sens. Nous pourrons aussi contribuer pour avoir des activités harmonisées dans ce sens et des, des démarches aussi harmonisées dans ce sens. Je voudrais aussi euh, voilà, soulever une, une petite... Euh, Voilà, quelque chose qui, mais qui, qui, qui je pense qu'il faudrait aussi, sur lequel on, on travaille un peu, il s'agit du paquet d'activités minimum, c'est-à-dire euh, euh, dans nos activités actuelles de coordination, il s'agit aussi à un moment donné de déterminer les activités qui vont avec l'urgence. Parce que quand on parle de LTP, on sait que les questions LTP se retrouvent sur, sur les trois phases, l'urgence, euh, le relèvement, ainsi que... Euh, les solutions durables. En ce qui est, quand il s'agit de questions LTP, toutes ces étapes-là se retrouvent. Mais il s'agit aussi vraiment de travailler sur le paquet minimum. Quand il y a une urgence dans une zone, quelles sont les activités sur lesquelles nous nous accordons, nous, en tant qu'acteurs LTP On peut dire que ce sont des activités euh, prioritaires qui euh, permettent quand même de sauver les vies sur lequel il faudrait aussi travailler et ainsi déterminer les activités euh, qu'on peut utiliser dans les, euh, dans, les, dans les accompagnements des solutions durables. Je sais que nous le faisons chacun de notre côté, selon notre expérience, selon notre contexte, mais il serait aussi mieux de pouvoir trouver un moyen de les harmoniser ensemble au niveau global afin que ça soit euh, non seulement défendu au niveau global et au niveau de chaque mission, euh, pays ou au niveau de chaque coordination. De plus en plus, ces genre de questions souvent nous revient euh, lors de nos rencontres avec, euh, avec les autres clusters parce que je pense qu'à l'âme niveau, il y a plus certains aspects qui sont harmonieux, des démarches bien harmonieuses, de sorte que quand il s'agit, quand on, dévo on, on, on aborde une question de, de VBG, presque tous les acteurs au niveau de la coordination sont déjà, ils comprennent déjà la situation, ils comprennent déjà ce qui est prioritaire, ce qui, voilà. Donc je pense que ça aussi, on devrait penser dans, dans nos différentes rencontres et réfléchir quand même sur, sur ces aspects et pouvoir les développer afin qu'on puisse être dans le bon sens pour vraiment euh, une question LTP au cœur de l'action humanitaire et aussi voilà. Donc l'autre point, je sais que chaque acteur, chaque coordination au niveau voilà, de chaque pays essaie de travailler avec les autres secteurs tels que APRI, WASH, Sécurité alimentaire. Voilà, donc ici au Mali, on a, on a de plus en plus de, de collaborations avec Abri et Wash, mais il serait aussi important qu'on puisse trouver un autre cadre ensemble aussi, de travailler et de discuter ensemble de nos expériences et de pouvoir aussi identifier des axes sur lesquels on peut travailler avec eux, comment on peut le faire pour pouvoir vraiment partager les expériences et de plus en plus quand même, c'est-à-dire de plus en plus trouver un moyen de, de, de mettre un cadre dans ce sens afin que ça soit plus euh, un truc euh, compris et global à tous les niveaux, qu'au niveau de chaque pays, chacun se retrouve à, à travailler chaque fois pour pouvoir euh, ramener ses liens. Donc, il faudrait aussi que ces liens, on les travaille ensemble ici et au niveau global, afin que euh, dès qu'il s'agit euh, de LTP, on sait que voilà, on travaille avec euh, Abri, on travaille avec euh, Wash, on travaille avec Sécurité alimentaire et éviter aussi ces 
cette confusion où chaque fois quand il s'agit de questions LTP, les, les acteurs appris pensent plutôt qu'il s'agit de, de questions appris. Donc, il faudrait quand même qu'on trouve à ces moyens de travailler afin de quand même pouvoir séparer les activités LTP et les activités appris une fois de plus. Parce que s'il s'agit d'une question de protection, il ne s'agit pas seulement d'une euh, question qui sera abordée juste par appris ou autre chose. Je pense que ce sont des points que je voulais aussi euh, profiter de cette occasion pour l'aborder et permettre quand même de, euh, dans les prochaines rencontres de développer euh, ces réflexions. Allez, merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Mohamed Anak. And uh, thank you, uh, uh, Trezor, for uh, jotting down the translation uh, in, in the chat. You'll be very welcome to join the task team. We look forward to, to that. Um, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that intervention. Ombretta, you want to come in? And then we will need to move on to the next. Uh, area. Yes, just briefly on this uh, comment, um, Jim, of, you know, the, um, I mean, whether the, the, the that there are these challenges and opportunities to work together across uh, with other HLP partners at the country level beyond the protection uh, group. Um, and basically, I think it was also in a way seeking uh, support and guidance uh, at the global level. So perhaps, uh, Jim, we could consider maybe one of the coming meeting to actually, you know, invite also global uh, uh coordinators from the shelter and other uh, you know protection i mean uh, the other clusters to see maybe also seek their perspective at the global level on how that could be uh, as well uh, facilitated and what are the criticalities and maybe recommendation on how that can also trickle down to country level from their side and i think uh, it it might be a a useful discussion to have in this forum just an idea as well. Thank you for raising this point, um, Mohammed. Yeah, thank you, Mohammed. Yeah, well noted and definitely, I think that would be a, a great conversation to have um, here, I agree. Um, so yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, great. Uh, good, well, there'll be much more to come on all of those those issues around the information management, data, understanding risks, indicators, etc. Um, so. Thanks for your interest and uh, we will be in contact about that. Now I'm going to move to the next item. Really pleased to welcome um, Jose Areza, who's an independent researcher um, working with ProCap, NRC, UNDP and other actors that deal with protection and land issues, who's going to um, present some of the work he's been doing uh, with others uh, in Myanmar. And um, yeah, Jose, over to, over to you. Thank you very much. and. Um... Sorry for my voice, but these air conditions in Southeast Asia are really killing me. So I'm going to talk about uh, Myanmar, of course. And um, let me see if I can present. Let me see. Turkey. One second. Mm. A ver, why am I still so uh, poorly literate in, in digital content if I'm always presenting this type of stuff? It's teams. But, we blame we blame teams. Uh, teams is terrible. <laughs> Let me see. I do share and then PowerPoint live. Browse my computer, I guess. I hope I don't get frozen like before. And I just want to, to say that I'm very happy to see some familiar faces also. Um, and, uh, you know, long old friends in the in the HLP business. Let me see if this opens. Okay, so basically what I'm going to do is to present a book that um, I have written together with Scott Leckie, who is also a, a well-known um, HLP expert 
with a lot of experience in different countries. And our, our book is called Before a Democracy Died, Housing, Land and Property Rights in Myanmar. And basically it's an analysis of all the, the work that was done in Myanmar between uh, 2011 and 2021, which was basically the, the window or the attempt at a democratic uh, transition, which unfortunately was um, ended by the military coup that took place on 21 February 2021, three years ago. And the book has an interesting analysis on, on how um, colonial land policies have survived over time and have influenced the, the land policies of subsequent governments and regimes. And in the case of Myanmar, the, the military regimes that started um, after 1962, when General Nguyen did another coup d'etat that toppled the democratic government, and uh, particularly in 1988, when Nguyen's regime collapsed and another military regime, which had a more let's say market-oriented spirit, took over and uh, basically replicated the British colonial legislation on, on wastelands, which basically considered any land that was not registered as a potential business opportunity for the, for the ruling elites, regardless of the actual use of this property by uh, rural communities which had customary, customary land systems. So in front of you, you have a, a brief historical timeline which uh, you know, explains a little bit this, uh, this process. The attempt at a, I'm not going, I'm going to do a short presentation because I guess you have a, a lot of stuff afterwards. But just to explain briefly the, the expectations that were created in the democratic transition uh, concerning land issues. You know, there was a lot of land activism. There were lots of, of new ideas put on the table. There was, of course, a progress in, in, the, in the peace um, aspect, a peace process that uh, became a very promising uh, political initiative. Then the, the, a couple of initiatives to try to establish some sort of restitution mechanism, but which were quite inadequate. Now, these were restitution mechanisms, but that were um, basically administrative, um, administrative mechanisms which lacked any real enforcement power and lacked any any independence and any uh, they were far from having the resources that would be needed for a, a real restitution process there was also a national land policy that was uh, approved by the government of on san Suu Kyi in 2016 and actually was developed by the previous uh, government that was dominated by the military and this um, land policy was very promising. It, it contained provisions on restitution, on recognition of customary tenure, et cetera, et cetera. There were also serious uh, legislative um, challenges. There was an amendment to, uh, to one of these pieces of legislation that had a, a colonial tone, the Vacant Fallow and Virgin Land Management Law which basically criminalized any customary land user that uh, failed to go through the process of land registration and basically signified a, a, an important legal threat for customary land users and ethnic minority communities. And that threat is still there. However, the situation at the moment is much, much worse. Now we have 
a, a very serious deterioration of, of uh, HLP rights protection with uh, land grabbing really unhinged, um, you know, no consideration for environmental protection whatsoever, uh, close to 78,000 houses destroyed since the coup, punitive confiscations of the property of political opponents, um, restrictions of the civic space through a, a law on a new law on associations registration, which creates you know new uh, new surveillance and uh, uh, a lot of new requirements for civil society organizations to comply with, and uh, basically a a very very dramatic. Uh, scenario which is you know worse than what it was before which you know it's uh, it was not departing from an ideal situation and just to to mention a, a little bit the the land grabbing no this is a long standing problems from the from the 90s onwards and before during the transition maybe there was a bit of restraint uh, because of international uh, uh, attention, the the idea of a national land use policy, etc. But now, you know, there's there are no safeguards whatsoever. Then you have uh, the destruction of uh, of housing, which in this map you can see that has concentrated in the region of Sagain, where the the resistance forces are are very active. Mass displacement of more than Two million persons, a very dramatic situation. At the moment, there's additional displacement because there has been a conscription law uh, issued by the military um, a week ago. And basically, any young uh, male or female person is, is at risk of being forcibly recruited into the Tatmadaw, which is a very very much a hated institution because of the human rights violations. The land administration and management bodies are in the hand of the military and there is very, very little trust. So communities, communities are going back to the um, customary and informal mechanisms. And of course, the ethnic armed organizations uh, own land policies and systems are being strengthened and are uh, covering more and more territory. This is particularly clear in the case of Rakhine, where the Arakan Army and the United League of Arakan are now controlling a considerable portion of territory and administering it. Also in Kachin and Shan, uh, there was an operation in October where a lot of territory was um, was taken from the junta's hand. I mentioned the restriction of the Civic space, of course, impact on women and girls. Uh, as we know, the, the impact of any HLP rights violations, it's always worse for women and girls from a variety of perspectives, uh, you know, from the increase in, in gender-based violence in, in camps, uh, the fact that women are dispossessed uh, much easier than men because Usually, the land is registered in the name of the of the male member of the family, and then something that is on top of it, and, and it's probably one of the the main issues. You know, it's the increasing vulnerability to climate change because Myanmar is one of the countries worst affected by climate change, and the outlook for the coming decade and decades is not looking good at all. You know, there's there are um, projections of an increase in uh, extreme weather events and then a rise in temperatures that will make some um, important areas of Myanmar unlivable because of more than 40 days of, uh, you know, temperatures are almost reaching 50 degrees. No, so it's it's a it's a dramatic scenario. So in this context, what are we doing? Um, I, I also work part time for UNDP for the HLP program. And, and one idea that we are developing is having interim HLP protection approaches and an interim in the sense that is while 
we had this military capture of the of the institutions no and we are looking at um, building people centered justice uh, building collaborative dispute resolution skills in strengthening digital safety um, doing all that uh, it's in the civil societies and communities hand to increase the resilience to extreme weather events at the at the village level and of course there's a lot that they can do you know because they can uh, at, very often the the real land management and land use at the village level is done by the communities it's not done through the formal system no so they can allocate land they can you know uh, make decisions concerning the idps that it are coming to to um, to the to the village because they have been displaced elsewhere they can make decisions concerning which crops they use and what kind of trees are planted to ensure resilience to to drought and, and other uh, problems and um, basically you know looking at ways to protect hrp rights in this context which is also interesting for other context um, other contexts in other countries where there is a, an illiberal, illiberal regime or a military capture institution. So I think the lessons are interesting to look at, you know, what works and what doesn't work. Also, the, the importance of understanding the, the history of especially post-colonial societies no? and how land has been used by the by the colonial authorities and how these practices have survived no? through legislation and, and policies. And um, also, of course, what, what can be done at present in a situation where parts of the country are, are controlled by the, the SAC, the State Administration Council, and other parts are controlled by ethnic armed organizations with their own land systems, and sometimes they're very very elaborate land policies, no? like the current National Union land policy. And, and then there is a last point, and which is imagining what could um, a federal land governance model look in the future, if and when there is a return to a democratic uh, transition. This is something that uh, civil society and many actors in, in Myanmar are very interested yeah. in because there's a lot of, uh, you know, they, they are not, not losing um, faith in a in a better future, and and they are thinking uh, thinking about it and want to discuss about it. And I will leave it there. And uh, thank you. And any question is very much welcome. And I'm very happy that I managed to share through Teams. You know. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Um, thanks. Yes. That was a um, fascinating uh, presentation and. Um, yeah, so highlighting some of the, the challenges, but also with some uh, ideas and suggestions for ways forward. I want to take a moment to open up if there are any questions or comments. Um, maybe uh, you could share also the link for um, to find out more about the, the book. Um, Myanmar is uh, an area where we've you know, seen some like support work from our side um, on coordination on HLP, um, but not not too much, partly because it being such a difficult environment to operate in from a um, uh, yeah, from the sort of humanitarian um, architecture point of view, I suppose. But um, but yeah, something we're keen to do more on. So um, it would be good to understand more. I don't know if people had any uh, comments or, or maybe have experienced working there themselves. I think one one thing that I will that I will point out is the which is interesting, what's the process of developing a, a restitution project, no? which happened during the attempted transition. No? So there were ideas, and actually in the book that we published, there is a model restitution uh, law that uh, was presented during the pre-coup period. It, it never happened, obviously, 
Mm. But I think it's an interesting, it was modeled in actually in the Balkans, no? and we have Massimo Moratti here who knows mm -hmm. a lot about Bosnia. No? And, um, and I think, uh, you know, in the context of Ukraine, where there is, you know, there is also talk about restitution, and uh, also, of course, in the context of uh, Palestine and Israel and the Gaza crisis, no, there's at some point during a conflict, we need to think about restitution. Uh, with the hope that it happens, and it may not happen, but but I think as as HRP HRP passionate people, no, we should always think, you know, how can we um, make sure that displaced persons and refugees get their their land and their housing back, you know? Yeah. Thank you. I mean, that could be very interesting. Um, I think there's a lot of discussions around uh, restitution uh, increasingly happening in, in many uh, situations, as you say. So uh, to draw on that experience could be very interesting. Ombretta, would you like to come in and um, and then, um, yeah, and then um, see on to the, to the next thing. But yeah, Ombretta, over to you. Thanks, uh, Jim. Uh, sorry, I tried to resist, but I couldn't. <laughs> I have to make a comment on this. Um, no, it's, thank you so much. It's very interesting uh, process um, um, analysis, and uh, exactly again on the point of restitution. Um, interesting and definitely we need to work more on this, and this is one of the areas as HLPOR we we identified as priority. Uh, but overall, there is also the aspect which I think is is linked of redistribution and I was just uh, reviewing, um, I'm just reviewing for uh, some work we are doing um, the the land redistribution policies that uh, have been introduced in the Arab region in the 70s, 80s and how they worked and not worked and what went wrong, which in a way is very similar um, because it's um, uh, yeah, you know, of course, between restitution and redistribution is also enter the, the part where you establish where in history is your cutoff line and, you know, and you do a, an analysis of the groups that have accumulated resources, including land and those who have been excluded and then you try to rebalance it. Um, and then, uh, so in a way, there are two, two sides of the same spectrum. And um, exactly one of the things that, that in the Syria case was very clear that, did, that made it fail overall, the, the land redistribution um, uh, schemes, uh, was that um, there wasn't an accompanying power redistribution um, mechanisms that actually uh, you know, supported then the people who receive land, the, the farmers to actually have the skills, the capacity, the resources, the capacity also to to associate and make use of these resources in a way, uh, you know, and remain in in their newly acquired power, or including through through the access to resources. Um, anyway, so all different and and uh, interesting uh, perspective, and it's always good I find, uh, you know, to. to to see all these overlapping layers of perspective when looking at HLP. Thank you, Jim, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you, and, and thanks again for, for joining us. And there is a, a question in the chat, which maybe you could write a response in the chat, um, just because I'm afraid we have to move on to the, the next agenda item. But thanks so much for being with us, and please do share links and any other information. And thanks, Trezor, for uh, translating uh, some pretty complex uh, stuff there. So really appreciate your support. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to turn uh, briefly now to um, Julie. So just, Berica, I'll come to you in one moment, but uh, Julie from Interaction has joined us and I know she has to leave on the hour. So I just wanted to give her the floor. Sorry, you have, to, I think, two minutes, which, you know, uh, is, is more than one. Uh, so please, over to you, Julie. Thanks, Jim, and plenty of time. Um, thank you for letting me pop in quickly before I have to go. Um, I just wanted to flag for the members of the HLP AOR two HLP conferences that are happening this year. Uh, the first will be happening next month, April 2nd to 4th in Puerto Rico. 
Um, it's an extension of last year's conference in DC, and it will be focusing on community and collective land rights. Um, the themes will include addressing challenges to HLP in Puerto Rico, and then some general HLP responses, including case studies on adverse possession, rental assistance, and resettlement. And then the second conference is again going to be held here in DC, May 16th and 17th. Um, this year's conference in DC will emphasize practice based sessions and workshops for all levels of experience, including sessions on due diligence standards, HLP practice across silos, and effectively advocating on HLP, among others. Um, while both conferences do encourage in person attendance, the plenary sessions will be streamed online for both. Um, so I'm going to drop that information here in the chat for everyone, including the registration links for both um, conferences. And I'm happy to answer any additional questions via email, which I've also dropped in the chat. So thanks again, Jim, for giving me these few minutes. Thanks, Julie. Thank you for that. Um, and yes, please do reach out to Julie if you are interested in, in those. And just to mention as well, the May conference is the same week as the World Bank Land Conference as well, in case you want to uh, double up your uh, opportunities for uh, engaging with uh, uh, sort of land issues uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, and there will be a session on uh, HLP at the World Bank Land Conference as well. Uh, more details to follow on that. So, yes, without further ado, um, over to you, Berekat. Um, pleased to uh, welcome you uh, to the call. Uh, Berekat Fatena is the uh, NRC ICLA specialist and HLP working Group coordinator in Ethiopia. Berke, over to you. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, for sake of uh, internet connectivity, I'll uh, shut my camera off. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, and nice to see your face briefly as well. But yes, please do turn your <laughs> camera off for your connectivity. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, for uh, I'll be mindful of the time. Uh, so what we did was we have a rapid uh, need assessment that was conducted in Ethiopia in two regions, and I'll be presenting briefly the uh, context and outcome of the assessment. So uh, basically, it will, it will include the meteorology, background key findings and recommendations of the assessment. So in terms of uh, meteorology, uh, what Bar we did... Sorry, Barakat, yeah. sorry, my mistake. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's showing the kind of slides overview rather than the presentation. Um, in case you can, okay, let me reshare. Let me reshare again. Thanks. Just so that we can see it more clearly. Sorry, I I missed. I didn't see that. That's better. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So. Uh... Coming to the methodology of uh, our assessment, basically we conducted the assessment in two parts of the country, uh, one in the northern part of the country and another one in Somali region, and it included uh, desk review, field work, uh, and of course household interviews, key informant interviews, and focus group discussions. Uh, just to give you an idea of the locations that we conducted the assessment, Somali region is on the eastern part and Tigray region is in the northern part of the country. Uh, the, the objective of the assessment was obviously to understand the HLP issues before displacement and upper return and any other intervening HLP issues and dispute resolution mechanisms that the community was facing. Uh, the, the target community include IDPs, IDP returnees, and host communities. And I would like to give you some background about the context that we are operating here in Ethiopia. Well, as you may already know, Ethiopia is currently facing a huge uh, challenge in terms of uh, uh, all humanitarian crisis. It's on top of all humanitarian top needs. Top, uh, needs. Uh, it, it has been this way for the past, uh, I think, six years. Uh, overall, we have over 21 million people in humanitarian need, even at the start of 2024. And in terms of HLP specifically, uh, for example, the HLP work produced the target pin of 4.4 million, and we are targeting about 800,000 people 
for 2024. Uh, in terms of the context that the HLP assessment was conducted, uh, one is in Tigray. The Tigray region, as you may already uh, remember, was in the midst of a uh, huge conflict for two years uh, with the federal government and the regional governments having a huge uh, war uh, which caused mass destruction of property, displacement and the like. And uh, since then, the situation hasn't improved that much. Still, it is the highest IDP number in the country and it has also the highest mobility rates. This is specifically important for HLDP as over 700,000 people have returned within the region and still, uh, despite that, there are over uh, 900,000 uh, IDPs. Uh, the Somali region is a bit different in that the context is the, the region is facing multiple contexts uh, through conflict and drought and flood. And uh, relative to the Somali region, there isn't, uh, relative to the north, it is much stable, but still it, 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 it has. Uh, uh, many IDPs due to these three uh, uh, problems. So it has over 1 million IDPs uh, currently. And another feature of this region is that the IDPs have been there for more than five years, since 2018, I think. And there are also, in, in addition to IDPs, over 300,000 refugees and asylum seekers in the region. So this is the context that we uh, operate. So. Uh, I'm not going to go deep into this part, but in Ethiopia, land basically is owned by the government. It is not allowed to, uh, the government holds the land on, on behalf of the people uh, and land cannot be sold. You have the right to uh, lease the land, transfer the land through inheritance in domain, uh, donation. This is what the law say, but if you go into practice, uh, especially in Somali region, the clans in the region effective, effectively control the land. Uh, even if they are not staying in the land, they still own uh, the right to housing, communal grazing, and dispute resolution. Uh, in fact, uh, it is basically similar to what the previous presenter uh, mentioned in terms of the, the difference between land law and what is actually happening on the ground. So any kind of humanitarian intervention will require uh, the involvement of the chiefs. So this is the general background of Ethiopia. So I'll go to the key findings of the HLP assessment. So the major gaps the assessment uh, discovered in the two regions are uh, basically lack of uh, or loss of documentation, HLP documentation, destruction of house and property, secondary occupation, informality of uh, tenor agreements, fraudulent HLP transaction, lack of uh, functional dispute resolution mechanism. So I'll go through this quickly. The first one, lack of documentation, uh, is probably the most common uh, HLP issue that as an RC uh, we face in this country, whether it is in Tigray or in Somali region. Uh, people from the very start do not have uh, HLP documents, land rights documents, or any kind of documents. But the conflict and the displacement experience have further uh, escalated the problem in the sense that, uh, for example, in the Tigray region, almost half the population, similar in, in both regions, almost half the population uh, stated that they don't have any kind of documents. And if there is any effort to return this displaced population to their origin is going to be very difficult because uh, uh, proofing of ownership is going to be an issue in the future. Similarly, those two communities also for cases the same issue. So this will be for any kind of durable solution that we are planning. The other HLP issue, which is common in both regions, is destruction of house and property. The amount of damage might be different in the Tigray region, uh, in addition to uh, private property, also public property uh, were damaged throughout the conflict. Uh, public schools, uh, cultural and religious properties were looted or damaged by armed groups, uh, which is a huge challenge. 
But in addition to that, almost all, uh, almost 89% of the respondents in this uh, assessment stated that they have lost private property because of the displacement experience when they move from Western Tigray to Central Tigray. Uh, the, the situation is almost similar in uh, Somali region of the assessment. So destruction of housing and property is an issue. And another main issue that we observe is secondary occupation of their lands. So uh, the IDPs that were uh, interviewed uh, and the returnees that interviewed stated that uh, their house have been confiscated and new occupants have moved in in most of their uh, recent locations. The main perpetrators or were armed groups from another ethnic group. Ethiopia is basically currently under uh, ethnic tension. There is continuous ethnic violence happening. And the main source of the ethnic violence is obviously land and access to land. Because of that, uh, new armed groups or new communities will move into uh, uh, displaced individuals' properties. Similarly, that, that, that is a common issue that happens in both communities, which requires uh, specific uh, implementations. Uh, the other issue that observed was informality of tenant agreements. People, uh, even before the contract, uh, even before the conflict, I mean, um, uh, having a proper uh, contract, HLDP uh, contract during transactions was rare. And after the, after the conflict, the issue also uh, basically exacerbated. And as a result, almost uh, uh, 20, only 20% 20 of individuals renting a house in both regions, in integral region, 20%, and in Somali region, 60% stated that they, own, they, uh, they don't have formal rent contracts. Overall, transactions are held by verbal contracts, oral contracts, uh, with local community leaders supervising it. And uh, another issue that we observed was uh, fraudulent HLP transactions. Uh, in both regions, uh, land is illegally sold uh, and naming rights to land is transferred without the involvement of the appropriate government bodies. And specifically, in relation to uh, the property that belongs to uh, displaced individuals, their property, their house, their uh, other properties were said to be confiscated and sold in the markets after they were displaced. This was uh, largely observed in both regions. The other issue uh, and the last issue that uh, the HLP uh, assessment observed was lack of dispute resolution mechanisms. In both regions, uh, many individuals indicated that they are currently involved in land disputes. Nonetheless, there is a dispute resolution mechanism. They are dissatisfied with the dispute resolution mechanism. Uh, in the Tigray region, the main reason is the destruction of uh, land registry offices in court structures, uh, the formal court structures are completely in non-existence in most parts of the, the region. In the Somali region, it is more with uh, lack of awareness about uh, the dispute resolution mechanism that is currently available. So uh, dissatisfaction with dispute resolution is the issue that was observed. I'll move on, considering the time briefly, uh, the major recommendation that was mentioned in the assessment was, firstly, humanitarian actors need to be aware of the mass the mass secondary occupation that happened in the country. And if there is a, going to be any kind of HLP intervention, we have to be aware of uh, in, inadvertently reinforcing this illegal occupation. So there has to be a way uh, to enforce that. Another issue is there's, there has to be a mechanism established because the issues involve millions of people. Uh, there has to be an established mass claim mechanism for conflicts related issues in Tigray region specifically, because uh, using the ordinary court structures and ordinary government structures might not be enough to uh, restitute or provide compensation for what is happening. Uh, finally, uh, finally, uh, uh, of course, there has to be more additional research that need assessment that need to be conducted. 
uh, and uh, there has to be more supports from the humanitarian community uh, working on HLP. But uh, in terms of HLP, I can give you as a coordinator that we have mass issues in terms of lack of budget and uh, part lack of uh, partners working on HLP issues. So that's uh, basically the assessment. If you have any questions, thank you. Uh, thank you, Barakat. Thank you for that um, really interesting analysis and to see some of those issues so clearly spelt out there. Um, and also the mm. recommendations and you know the link with the previous presenter actually talking about uh, uh, sort of mass claims and how we how we respond to some of these uh, large scale uh, interventions that are needed. Um, would anyone have any uh, questions or comments for Barakat and uh, either based on your own experience with Ethiopia mm. or uh, or, or maybe other uh, other uh, areas. Um, Elsa asks if the report has been published. I um, is, is I don't know if this analysis is out yet. It's uh, it's quite recent, isn't it, Barakat? So I imagine it's still being. Yeah. Yes, it's being. Um, we'll uh, share with you once it is finalized. Thank you. Uh, who's got a hand up? Uh, Lud Miller. Yes, it's over to you. Thank you. Just one quick question. I would like to know how far is their political uh, their political conditions for land restitution for the Tigray region in Ethiopia? Are these conditions there? They can be built. How is it going? Um, okay, should I? Should yes, I? please. Okay. Go, go for All it. right, so uh, the conditions are a bit tricky, as you understand. Uh, there are two parts, uh, Western Tigray, which basically is currently occupied by uh, another region, military force from another region and military force from another country. It is basically untouchable and it's very politically sensitive. Uh, so I would assume that it will uh, require huge political efforts to restitute people to Western Tigray. But the, uh, the displacement also happened within uh, central and eastern Tigray within the community itself, uh, especially in the border areas where there was conflict, and that's where HLDP issues are. We are observing more HLDP issues. So over 700,000 individuals returned to their community. These communities are within those uh, uh, border areas where there is currently uh, conflict. So it depends on Western Tigray. I would assume it will require more political will and lots of negotiation. But our work is mostly in the, within the community itself. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Barakat. Thanks, Lumela. Um, OK, well, in the interest of time, we will leave it there. But thank you, Barakat, for that. And let's we can come back to that. I know when the um, the report is uh, developed further and uh, the analysis looked at. So um, yeah, but thanks for, for joining us and for, for sharing that and we'll follow up for sure. Um, thank you. I'm going to um, um, pass over now to um, Ibire Lopez, who's the Global Shelter Cluster HLP focal point and is going to provide us uh, an update on some of the uh, activities that he's working on related to HLP. Ibire, over to you. All right. Th thanks, Jim. Uh, hi, everyone. Good to see you all here. Uh, let me go very quickly through the uh, updates. Um, there are a few of them. I'm just going to give you the most uh, exciting ones, so stay tuned. The first one is the toolkit, the shelter and HRP toolkit. That is um, the first draft is done. We are just working to put it online so that we will do the consultation for this toolkit. Uh, on a digital platform. We think that's going to work better for feedback than just sending the document around. So the toolkit is going to be um, on our website. We're going to share the link soon. Then the lender rights and due diligence guidelines, the one that, that exists uh, 
the, the charter one that exists from 2013, we're updating it, and that's going to be put for consultation on the next quarter uh, as well. For the e-course on HRPN displacement uh, that you are probably familiar with, we have four modules now, and we are we are off finishing the fifth module. Uh, it's an online training. It's in, it's in interactive video form. Um, Jim's gonna hopefully paste the the link to the first four modules it's in the there. chat. Good. Quick. Um, the fifth one is going to be integrated within the, the the series of modules. The fifth one's focus on climate change uh, mitigation and and action um, related to HRP. Um, we are also going to translate all of these modules because now they are only in English uh, and it's a bit technically complicated to do language versions because of the way that they've been produced. Uh, as interactive video, but it's possible. It's just expensive and uh, and takes some time. But we already have uh, mobilized funds for a version in Arabic, uh, in Somali, in French. And then if uh, any of you want to contribute to a new language, then uh, get in touch with me and then we can put you in the package to do it in Spanish or in Portuguese or or whatever language uh, is relevant to the area where you work. And then uh, the last one is that this year we're going to work on integrating HRP into the curriculum of the Shelter Clusters Coordinators training. It's the training that the Shelter Clusters Coordinators do every year, and uh, there's no HRP component at the moment. We're going to uh, integrate that into their training. And um, at last but not least, we are going to prepare this year a uh, curriculum for uh, shelter practitioners on HRP. So something that can be adapted to the different regions um, with, um, uh, yeah, th but this is a project that will be for the second semester. And um, and uh, and that's it. I don't think I have another, oh, I have another update about the, <laughs> about the, the conferences. So I don't know if you, spoke about this yet or not Ju yet. Julie mentioned the Puerto Rico and the DC European crisis DC. but feel free the, and the World Bank it was I mentioned it very briefly but please go for it okay good so yeah that's the World Bank land conference again this year uh they're back and uh we have a HRP slot on it in Breto B presenting uh and some of us as well and we have four hours so if you can join, please join. And that's it from my side. Excellent. Four hours of Ibere. What could be better? Right. Thank you for that. Um, great update. And um, yeah, Joseph, you want to add something to that, maybe? Yeah, I shared the link earlier. Registration for the World Bank is open. I think it's $250. But uh, if you want to join, register for the World Bank conference, that is now publicly open on their site. There's a link higher up in the chat. Great, thanks. And, and part of the, the session that's being developed on HLP is looking at those links between HLP and, you know, more kind of typically development durable solutions nexus and how we make those links better and look at it through different angles. So it should be a very interesting time. And we have quite a big chunk of time to be able to work on things together as well. So it should be great. Um, thanks very much for that update. Um, lots of interesting things happening that we'll make sure we kind of keep coordinated on. Um, really good to hear that HLP will be included in the Shelter Cluster Coordinator training. That's really exciting. Um, really super pleased to hear that. So uh, brilliant. Um, thank you. OK, so we have about 10 minutes nearly left and want to open it up to some updates from colleagues online. I know uh, as a couple of colleagues who I believe will want to share something, um, Emily Benner joins us um, to uh, give us a brief update on some work she's engaged with on uh, HLP uh, briefing notes, I believe. Please, Emily, over to you. If you'd like to just introduce yourself and, and briefly outline the uh, programme. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you well. Excellent. Hi, everyone. Um, like Jim mentioned, my name is Emily Benner. Um, I'm a graduate student at American University, and um, I'm working with a group of other students on some uh, briefing papers, as Jim mentioned. Um, 
our focus is primarily in trying to understand and demystify um, various land tenure frameworks and arrangements, um, understanding you know, the relationships uh, between IDPs and various actors that you all are very familiar with. Um, and right now we're focusing in on uh, uh, four different countries, Nigeria, Somalia, Ethiopia, and Mozambique. Um, and so we want these briefing papers to be very useful to all of uh, the practitioners and you all included. Um, so if there is um, any of you, your staff, or anyone interested in um, speaking with us more about it, sharing any of your expertise, we would be very happy to, to talk to you and make sure that what we're putting together um, is both comprehensive, understandable, um, and useful to, to folks in the field and practitioners stepping into these contexts. Um, I'm happy to say a little bit more, but I know we're short on time, so um, I'll drop my contact information in the chat, and then hopefully uh, Jim and I can work on sending something out, um, following up with a little bit more information. But thank you so much, and it was really interesting to hear all of the conversation today. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. And yeah, as Emily says, that's um, a part of trying to give people kind of context and understanding in an accessible way. Uh, on HLP issues, which of course is a massive challenge that we are all trying to work on. Um, uh, but yes, um, and, and one of the things we'll at least be doing with those as they're drafted is sharing them for, for review with some of our colleagues in, in the, the operations as well. So thanks, Emily, for joining us and yeah, we'll share some more information on those. Um, going through my list, I see Ramona, please come in. Thank you, Jim, and thanks, Emily. Uh, for the update on that, I for sure am looking forward to <laughs> to reading the briefing notes. I thought I'd mention NRC also has a report out that focuses on doing exactly this, uh, demystifying the concept of tenure security, especially to humanitarian practitioners, so that we can <laughs> jointly reflect and better program, keeping this in mind. I wanted to share a brief update um, related to HLP. Uh, NRC Sudan has just has recently published a report on uh, HLP in Sudan and uh, looking at analyzing HLP considerations across all phases in uh, of the of the crisis, so from emergency until recovery. Of course, touching upon peace building as well as climate aspects, and uh, basically ringing the bell of why is it that it is paramount to properly and early on start considering HLP in order to pave the way to not just uh, making sure we ensure compliance with do no harm, also uh, building up to early recovery and creating a climate conducive to durable solutions, or conversely, if that is not done, to just hinder and uh, well create drivers, further drivers for conflict. So wanted to share that. I will drop in the in the chat box the uh, link to access the publication, and I do hope um, you will read it with interest. I also wanted to let colleagues know that we will be org oh, thank you so much, Jim, <laughs> that we will be organizing the uh, webinar to launch the report next week. Uh, tentative date for this to be very soon confirmed is uh, next week, 11th of March, 10 a.m. Sudan time. We will make sure to request Ombreta and Jim to circulate the invite to the webinar once we finalize with the setup. And I do hope to uh, have you all there and engage with us on this on this topic. Yes, I also wanted to share some updates related to the uh, as a co-chair of the HLP uh, uh, working group in Sudan is that uh, we've been working closely with um, Wala, my, my colleague uh, from uh, UN Habitat, to put the final touches and uh, be able to very soon call for our first uh, meeting <laughs> as a HLP working group because we have been putting a lot of effort into reviving it. So yeah, we do hope to be able to do so by um, uh, end of March. And we will also keep you posted in case that is something of interest to the wider group. Well, I don't know if you want anything to add on this. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Ramona. Uh, Walla, yes, please do if you uh, wanted to. Otherwise, it's OK. Um, OK, we'll leave that for now. Uh, Clementine, I see you're next. Over to you. 
Merci, Jim. Je vais euh, aller y aller en français. Donc, je vais solliciter l'appui de Trésor pour la traduction, si possible. Ben, pour le update du Niger, euh, après l'analyse de la situation des sites au Niger, on s'est rendu compte que près de 70% de personnes étaient installées sur les sites euh, sans aucune autorisation. Également, après une présentation de LTB dans le, dans le, avec les collègues de RRM, on s'est rendu compte que ceux-ci ne prenaient pas en compte les questions de LTB dès la phase de RRM de la réponse humanitaire. Donc, suite à cela, avec l'appui du cluster Abri, ici porté par OIM au Niger, nous avons conduit euh, les sessions de formation euh, dans déjà deux régions. Ça va se faire sur l'étendue du territoire. On l'a déjà fait à, Mar à Maradi et à Difa. Et sur le terrain, on a pu se rendre compte de l'impact de la non prise en compte des problèmes de LTB par les acteurs humanitaires dans toutes les réponses. Y compris, on s'est rendu compte également que la majorité des autorités n'avait pas connaissance des textes euh, en matière de foncier qui sont euh, adoptés au niveau national. Il y a vraiment un manque de connaissance de tous les acteurs sur ces questions-là. Et on a formulé pas mal de recommandations que je pourrais euh, partager, mais la première recommandation qui a été véritablement prise en compte, c'est de développer les outils de sensibilisation que nous allons adresser euh, à tous les acteurs humanitaires et même aux autorités. Donc, de ce fait, NSC avait l'appui du secrétariat permanent dans la partie gouvernementale. On a eu cinq jours d'atelier où nous avons développé les outils de sensibilisation. Et euh, actuellement, nous sommes en salle avec euh, les différents clusters, notamment le cluster euh, abri, le cluster sécurité alimentaire et euh, les autres AOR de la protection pour pouvoir valider ces outils qui seront par la suite ventilés et traduits en outils de communication que les acteurs pourront utiliser dans leurs activités. Donc, voilà un peu le update pour le Niger. Merci. Thank you. Merci, Clementine. I uh, appreciate that. Um, Trezor, would you like to share that very clearly or you've put in the chat um, uh, that update from uh, Clementine? Thank you very much, Clementine, uh, for that. Um, OK, we're nearly at time. Um, I wanted to also, I said about sharing resources. so. I wanted to share some resources. Um, Ombretta, would you like to um, share from uh, your side? I think the uh, Arab Land Initiative had some resources that might be relevant for colleagues here. And if other people would like to put things in the chat, please do. I'm just going to put sure. some things in the chat that might be of interest for you. So, um, but uh, over to you, Ombretta. Yeah, just briefly. Thanks, Jim, and uh, thanks also for sharing colleagues the other resources. Um, uh, at Yen Habitat, we are also creating uh, country pages, starting with the Arab region, uh, which include uh, all res um, uh, useful resources and reports uh, related to HLP, but land a bit more in general. And we are at the same time releasing some of the most recent publication. We just published um, this one that I put in the chat, uh, which is called Land Governance and Land Rights in Palestine, uh, which is a kind of a long report that took uh, the different components of the land uh, administration sector, you know, the land rights on one side, but also the land use the land valuation and costing, the dispute resolution, the land use dynamics and the related the relevant legislation and institutional um, arrangements that are there. Um, so this is obviously, uh, you know, it's quite comprehensive, but at the same time, uh, you know, it can constitute uh, a good uh, baseline tool to, to actually even look at you know, how, what can be done and what needs to be done on the shorter terms in, in Gaza, but as well in the West Bank. And I just want to say also in the same page where this report is, um, is uh, present, there are also a lot of other resources, uh, including, you know, produced by partners like NRC and others that are looking at specific aspects of HLP in the country. Uh, we'll be sharing this and other, you know, through the HLP mailing list, uh, and also we'll make the links in the uh, uh, HLP uh, AOR webpage so that we we start building a little bit the, the knowledge, you know, from all sides of the humanitarian development nexus. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out if you 
if you need more information. And uh, thank you. Over to you, Jim. Thanks, Ombretta. And I added some other resources into the chat as well that were uh, some of which are, are recent, uh, but hopefully of interest. And please, again, just uh, if you have things to share, please do share them. We have our, our global updates which go out every quarter. So like the newsletter, essentially, where we can share news of events, resources um, and uh, reports, products, anything you would like uh, to share there. We can potentially do that there. So please do share them and um, if you had anything to add here, you're very welcome. OK, so um, we've reached time. Uh, thank you for a very, very interesting uh, call. I uh, found that fascinating. Thank you to our presenters on Myanmar and on Ethiopia, uh, Bereket, Jose. Thank you for joining us on that. Thank you, Bire, for your update and for other colleagues who have uh, shared and Trezor for your support with the uh, uh, translation. Very much appreciated. Um, Ombretta, over to you for our final wisdom. It's going to become a regular feature. Thanks, this. Uh, thank you, Jim. And nothing really to add. It was a great meeting and thanks to all of you for participating. Um, so have a good afternoon and evening. Bye. And yes, and if you want to do cameras on to wave goodbye, that's always fun ish. At least it's nice. I like it. I can't even put my camera on, but I'm imagine yeah. my my face waving at you all. Thank you. Thanks. Great to see you all. Nice to Thanks see for joining. You. Bye. Okay. Thanks to see you all. Thanks everyone. Bye. Great. Bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.